Kirsten, let me, let me give you a little background about myself. I, as a uh, few said, I, I'm kind of a vagabond, you know, you know, transportation is, a uh, is an industry really diverse and there's so many components of it. You know, you can work in government, you can work in industry, you can work with ver the various modes. I grew up in a little town called Laredo, Texas. Some of you may know that uh, little town. It's a border town to Nuevo Laredo, and it's uh, it's on the I-35 corridor. Why is that important? I-35 corridor is a NAFTA corridor from you know Laredo, Texas, all the way to Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, so as it relates to trade, you know the, the transportation bug bit me very early. Started my 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 field uh, in this industry, uh, working for Texas Department of Transportation. Um, it's just something I, I you know, in, in this industry, uh, nobody says I want to be a transportation professional. You just you just kind of get in, get into it. And I've had the good fortune of working for some great agencies, uh, a port, and then now the as we call it the dark side, right? Um, but uh, some of the items I've worked on are been on the right hand side here as it relates to the port tunnel, looking at. Uh, congestion and trucking going in and out of the port, uh, the Miami River study as it relates to uh, barge traffic, utilizing other modes of transportation to move uh, cargo, and also to the resiliency side that maybe some of you are not very familiar with, but it's been a hot topic for the past various years, resiliency, sustainability, whatever you want to call it, the government, uh, the states uh, have been really keen in, in on this. So it's an area we're, we're focusing on too. Also to stop me whenever you want, you know, it, for clarification, I know our, our time is short, but I do want to kind of cover as much as I can. Uh, you may not be familiar with Jacobs, but Jacobs uh, is one of the largest transportation um, uh, designing planning firms. I do want to highlight, um, there we go, uh, and our locations. We have a great breadth of folks here in the state. The, uh, our our uh, CEO, Steve Demetrio, it, had the, this company was uh, based in Pasadena, California, but he moved it to Dallas to be more centralized. So we have better connectivity to our offices. Now you may have not heard of Jacobs, but J Jacobs in the last uh, 10, 15 years has been acquiring a lot of companies, other companies you may be familiar with, Streetlight Data, CH2M Hill, Lee Fisher as it relates to the aviation side, one of the private investment uh, for uh, airlines, Hal Crow, uh, one of the leaders as it relates to ports, so it's a vagabond group of people, but when it comes to transportation, it really needs to be an integrated uh, um, industry of, of experts, right? And it's it's uh, it, sometimes it's challenging as it relates to, you have people in various disciplines, aviation, ports, design, planning, right? Uh, and historically, when I was growing up, these people never spoke to each other, you know, uh, pretty much in these silos. Those, right, they did what they did and, and they left it at that. But as it relates to this integration, is something that you know I'm going to be highlighting in this conversation for the next couple of minutes. Just a quick overview of things I want to highlight. Um, when I say port, I, I mean airport and port, right? And part of this discussion with ports and myths and, uh, uh, is that a port is a port is a port. You know, a port is a unique facility in a state, in a region, in a county. Um, that really adds a lot of value. And depending on what you're moving, depending where the region is, depending where you're connected to the network, a waterway, a rail spur, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, transit as it relates to connectivity of people, these things do matter, right? Um, I think a lot of people, you know, we, we're in the industry, so we're, we're kind of uh, preaching to the choir, but you know, there's been a lot of interest in the past couple of years as it relates to the Amazon effect, right? Um, and this thing about, you know, the challenges in the West Coast and, and, and companies like Amazon commandeering ships saying, look, we need to justify and make sure that our cargo is going to get to its final destination. And since then, you've seen other companies follow Home Depot, Walmart, Costco being one of them. The COVID-19, I think, has put everything upside down, not only people working from home, but people buying a lot of stuff too, right? Uh, I always argue that freight goes where the people go. It doesn't matter if it's Mississippi or, you know, Tallahassee, Florida. People, freight goes where the people go, right? I put HOS because, you know, some of you are familiar with the hours of service for trucking. This was a big one because, you know, there's not enough truckers to go around. And uh, there's been a lot of studies on this, quite interesting. The uh, uh, ATA, American Trucking Association, actually did a study on this and actually has zoned in on the premium truck driver. He or she is around 
45, 50 years of age, knows a truck, knows the roads, knows how to turn the rig, you know, this, you know, this doesn't happen overnight. You know, you see a lot of younger people getting into the in this industry, 18 or 19 years old, but this is a component of the supply chain, right? Think of the trucking industry as the go-go gadget arm, right? You know, the port can take it to the port and you can take it off with the, you know, and put it, the container on the, um, on the land side, but as it relates to moving it, that's really the go-go gadget arm. And this issue of resiliency that's becoming a big area of, of focus. Why is this? Now, I want you to look at that picture in the middle right there. Now, think about that. You know, we have ships coming in, you know, 18, 16,000 TEUs, meaning that, you know, containers. These are individual containers coming to the port. And, you know, as it relates to NOx, SOx, you know, particular matter going into the air, depending where the port is, you see a lot of, you know, stuff floating in the air and people are saying, you know, look, I'm in the adjacent city. I don't like this stuff coming in, right? So having this balance of freight and livability and sustainability has become a very, very, very real thing in the past couple of years, right? Uh, one of the things I did want to talk about, you know, uh, on the technology side, um, the great thing about Jacobs is, and the people I work with, right, we, we, we look at this from various components, right, as it relates to, you know, IoT, the Internet of Things, or I like to call it the information of things, right? Because uh, smart cities is something that you've been uh, hearing a lot about. What does that mean? Is it, it, you know, is it cameras? Is it sensor technology? Well, that's all that in a bag of chips, because when it comes to connectivity of, of goods and freight, we can see peak times, right? We can see what's moving in the network, right? Uh, counties, cities, uh, departments of transportation can make these better strategic uh, uh, investments of where to put the infrastructure and the needs, right? Uh, are we there yet? Not really. Are we getting there? Absolutely. Uh, but as it relates to just not the modes of transportation, but of the, the right of way as it relates to utilities, water, you know, you see tremendous growth happening in our cities and, and metropolitan cities for, uh, for Lauderdale, Miami. But as it relates to the guts and, and, and what's beneath, you know, we're talking about an antiquated system built in the 1940s, not 50s, right? So this is something we're constantly looking at. Now, this is not me. This is something that a state leads, right? And uh, there was a gentleman that introduced himself as it relates to him coming to the state of Florida. And I, what I want to say is not only welcome, but you know, you're coming to a state very aggressive and looking at all the modes of transportation. The old days, I'm, I'm a DOT guy by, by training, and it's always been the big H, right, as it relates to highways. And I remember people, when I did my Southern baptism in Mississippi, people said, son, we built roads here, right? And this thing of intermodalness, uh, connectivity of the other modes of, uh, of uh, transportation was not very well accepted, right? As it relates to, well, uh, transit, and that's in the big cities. As it relates to rail, that's private. Air, uh, air, uh, airports and ports, that's a county uh, facility, right? So as it relates to connectivity to the network, right? Uh, Florida has been very aggressive. We're really looking at this going back into the early 2013, um, why is this important? Well, the Panama Canal kind of kicked open, um, you know, uh, with the, with the ex expansion of the locks. And many of you know that Florida, uh, you know, in, is very close proximity to the Americas and the Panama, and Panama right? Our, our trading partner is uh, the Americas, right? I, I mentioned to you that I grew up in Laredo, Texas, and what Laredo was to Mexico, I would argue Florida is to the Americas, right? So as it, as it relates to a trading block, as it relates to... Uh, uh, you know, it's not Georgia, it's not Mississippi, it's Alabama, but it's our partners to the South too that are providing us that, that, that network, right, of Kingston, you know, uh, you know maybe Cuba in, in, in the foreseeable future. But these things are, they're always looking at. Some of the concepts that we're looking at too as it relates to not only the project development, right, but take a look at that picture right there, right? That picture says, you know, so much as it relates to, you know, you have residency across the, the roadway right there. You have an intermodal facility as it relates to a rail yard adjacent. And then you have these cranes, you know, moving all this cargo, right? The thing about it is how does all this stuff work together, right? What is, how do we implement this and, 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 and work with the region, right, to accept this, right? And these are things we're always constantly looking at. Uh, but it's just not building infrastructure, right? It's just not, you know, saying, okay, it's coming. Containers are, 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 are around us. What do we do? And you have to kind of do a deep dive approach, right? Some of the things and concepts that have been developing over the past couple of years are called intermodal freight planning. Uh, now, uh, by law, by the US DOT, Department of Transportation, by law, requires each state, each state there do a freight plan which means that he or she uh, is responsible for looking at the modes of transportation, rail, private, as it relates to ports, 
um, you know, our corridors, you know, congestion, right? Truck traffic coming in and out, right? And that will give us a better idea of how to harmonize all these modes, right? So policy uh, is a critical one. Um, and the federal legislation that you see coming out in, in the next uh, couple of months as it relates to funding this is going to be a big one too. The class one railroads, you know, always, uh, if you're not familiar with the class ones, BNSF, CSX, you know, CSX is home here in Jacksonville, um, uh, Norfolk Southern, um, uh, KCS, you know, UP, these are the big boys as it relates to um, moving freight to, but as it relates to more of the chemical coal area, a big one. The issue with the with the, the rail people, and I mean this with all due respect, but they have like the Ricky Bobby uh, 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 focus as it relates to, they want to go straight, they want to go, uh, they want to go fast, and they don't want to stop. And as it relates to connectivity to the modes of transportation, this becomes somewhat challenging, right? We see this too with the rail collisions and the interaction with people, right? So as it relates to this balance of both livability and, and, and moving the goods, we have to find a better balance of that, right? Supply chain integration, you know, it, uh, you know, as, as here at Florida Gulf Coast, you know, you see the importance of, you know, teaching this within uh, the university level, right? Uh, this has been a challenge because when I was going to school, there was no such thing as a supply chain management program. You know, I have to pretty much, you know, do an MBA and then focus, uh, do my, uh, my, my graduate work in logistics, right? Uh, but now the, the industry, the university, you know, the uh, government has really embraced this and, and really have, has a better understanding of how to, how to do this, right? Um, now, it... Uh, Maybe some of you have seen this map before uh, on the right-hand side. This is something that uh, US DOT uh, developed uh, early 2000s, right? A good friend of mine actually was one of the pioneers that actually developed these, they call them the blood maps, right? Does anybody want to take a guess what the, uh, the, the dark red um, lines are? Anybody do I have any takers? Well, the, the, the dark red are actually the highways. Those are strategic highways. So think about it, I-10, I-75, you know, I-35. Many of you know that, you know, this, this thing was not built for commerce. It was built for Department of Defense, right? So as it relates to getting our boys or Jeeps or tanks from one point to another, it's critical. That blue right there is the waterway as it relates to the mighty Mississippi, right? So as it relates to the inland waterways, other modes of, 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 uh, that the state have been utilizing to move uh, cargo, right? Tennessee Tom Bigby, a man-made waterway that was developed in the 1960s, back in the days of Lyndon Johnson. And then the dark light red that you see is home uh, of uh, the rail freight rail industry. All the seven lines, all the seven uh, uh, CSX, I mean, all the seven, freight lines intersect in Chicago. So that's why you see that, that light red right there. Uh, that's when all the rail lines merge, right? Um, so that this is a big one, right? You have to understand the component, but I want I want I, I, I love this slide. Since then they've, they've corrected. There's something technically wrong with this map. Can anybody see what's wrong with it? Hmm. You have any takers? Is there any? Are there any hints? Uh, some it, disconnection. There is some continuity, some uh, disconnection between water, rail. I don't know. <laughs> Lee, no, I, I think you, Lee hit it on the nose as it relates to the connectivity to the other uh, countries, as it relates to the Canadians and the Mexicans, right? Pretty much US DOT uh, had it very much focused as it relates to just within the United States. Since then, they've corrected these maps and now show integration working with the Mexicans, the Canadians. Uh, te uh, Texas Department of Transportation actually does a freight plan in conjunction with the Mexicans as it relates to anticipation of freight uh, growth and movement. So this is something that, you know, now the, the US DOT is really having a more integrated approach of moving goods, right? Remember the ports are components, right? They get to us, uh, get the freight, but as it relates to, is it a land border, uh, a, a gateway, like a border? Is it a, a air, airport? Is it a port facility? Well, it's all done in a bag of chips, right? Uh, but again, the policy, had to get in front of this as it relates to thou shall recognize freight, thou shall recognize the ports, right? So it's just not engineering and planning and designing this, but as it relates to, you know, uh, a statute, the, the, the uh, working with our locals, MPOs and TPOs, and I'll get in that, into that a little bit right now as it relates to what their needs are, right? 
I want to do a little deep dive as it relates to when we, when we start getting into the ports, right? You know, some of you may be familiar with these acronyms, FDA, USDA, uh, C, uh, CBP, uh, um, as it relates to Customs Border Protection, you know, USDA from the ag side and FDA, Food and Drug Administration. These people are actually at the ports and these people are monitoring what comes in and out of the port, right? Remember 9-11, 9-11 really changed and, and, and put everything upside down. Uh, I don't, I'm speaking to the choir here, but as many of you know that less than 2% of the cargo coming into the country is actually monitored or, or checked, right? There are some programs in play that, you know, expedite some of the cargo with some of the larger companies, but as it relates to uh, the, the, the volume of freight coming in, you no know, can do. I remember back in 9-11 when there was a uh, federal policy looking at, we need to screen 100% of the cargo coming in. And the industry started yelling and saying, are you crazy? Do you know what that will ha what will happen? Commerce will stop at its tracks, right? Uh, because you can't, you know, you know, you got 16, 17, uh, 18,000 uh, TEUs coming in at, at one pop. How do you expect goods to move, right? So this is another area of focus that we've been trying to focus on as it relates to educating the, the people, right? Um, this here's another continuation of the US DOT. Uh, this is somewhat dated, but it kind of gives you an idea of the freight uh, connectivity of, of the state and what we do, right? And you see the red lines going into the other states. Those red lines uh, highlight where the freight that's coming into the state of Florida goes out to, right? So it might stop at Florida or it might uh, uh, come in through Florida, but it doesn't stop there, right? Uh, Miami and, and, and uh, Port Everglades, you know, really services 12 counties. It, it's very niche, like same thing with the Port of Houston, right? It pretty much stays there because you have a, 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 feeding, a feeding frenzy of people that just eat and, 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 and take, 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 right? But uh, a, a majority or a small, uh, about 40% of the cargo that comes into Florida actually comes in from other states. Quite the opposite too. Our biggest challenger right now is Savannah. Savannah actually um, moves about, uh, last time I checked, 4.2 million TEUs, give or take, right? Um, that is the uh, equivalent of the Port of Jacksonville, the Port of Everglades, and Miami combined in, in movement of TEUs, right? Now, granted, the portfolio of these ports are very different because we have crews, right? Crews and cargo. Now, if you're talking to a port operator, you know, they want that healthy balance as it relates to, look, uh, you know, this is a county operation. Sometimes cargo is high, just like the past couple of months. Sometimes cruise is good, right? And cruise pays premium, right? And it goes back into the uh, county coffers and it helps fund these people. Uh, I wanted to highlight this one because you got to do a deep dive again here, ladies and gentlemen. It's just not the modes and the freight, right? You have to understand the counties, right? And this is why I, I, I bring up these slides. Does anybody know what an MPO is or a TPO? These people, you know, are, are the ones responsible for the local planning within the county as it relates to how do we develop, right? And a lot of these folks for the past couple of years, uh, this changed in, in 2015 when freight became a priority. Uh, they were looking at roads, they were looking at livability, they were looking at uh, um, uh, uh, transit, they were looking at uh, um, as it relates to micro mobility, you know, scooters and all that stuff, which is all fine and dandy, but who's covering the freight? So the MPO TPOs now are responsible for, you know, highlighting freight. And here's the kicker, ladies and gentlemen, these TPOs and MPOs are responsible also for their long range plans as it relates to priority projects, right? So they have to work with the DOT, they have to work with the locals, they have to have uh, conduct town hall meetings about what the locals want. And if the locals don't want freight, well, guess what? Freight's not going to be in your backyard. So this constant education, this constant engagement with the locals, the industry, and in the private sector is critical as we move forward, right? Um, oddly enough, um, you know, uh, Florida has the most MPOs of any other uh, state. Uh, last I checked, uh, California has 16 MPOs. We have 27 MPOs. Um, what's going on? Well, there's a whole lot of planning going on. And I show this, uh, 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 this picture because some of you know what I'm talking about. The challenges and issues in the, in the panhandle are different from the northeast part of the state with Jacksonville, are different from central Florida with the ears and Mickey Mouse and, and the tourism as it relates to southwest Florida, as it relates to southeast Florida 
uh, with their connections to the Americas, right? And each one has to, you, you have to kind of do a deep dive analysis to really understand it, right? And, I, and there I go as it relates to mentioning this. Now, I did mention that uh, I was gonna be talking about Eric Glades Airport. Uh, Eric Glades Eric Airport, you may not be familiar with this airport. This airport is in Henry County. Henry County is one of the more impoverished uh, counties in the state, right? Uh, home of U.S. Sugar, but as it relates to them wanting to transform themselves, right? They know that uh, Miami has a good healthy balance of cargo and passenger, right? But as if you've been to Miami, it's, it's being locked out as it relates to it. There's not enough room. And a lot of those uh, parcels of real estate that was used for warehousing and distribution are going away as it relates to livability, residential living. People want to come and live there. The question that becomes, where does freight go? Well, you know, freight's going to have to move up the block. And what we're seeing now is a lot of these uh, agencies moving up north to Tamarack, to Miramar and Broward County, and some of these going into Southwest Florida, quite uh, uh, honestly, using Highway 27 and Highway uh, and Interstate 75 for that connectivity again. So, you know, again, the roads, the network, the transportation is that go-go gadget arm of the, of the port, right? And that's a big one. I mentioned some other things too, as it relates to the long range planning, the modeling, you know, um, the state has become very strategic as it relates to the data will justify the investment. The data will justify the investment. Is it actually data? Is it streetlight data? For the, in order the state to move forward with the project, it has to show a return on investment as it relates to, you know, are people moving here? Is there a need for this, right? We're not just, you know, help hoping and wishing that something is built here. And, um, you know, it, uh, uh, if you build it, they will come, right? The states have become very strategic as it relates to not enough money going around, right? I did want to pay homage to a good friend of mine, uh, Fred Ford, the gentleman in the picture there, uh, actually uh, a pioneer within Pan Am, but also was the airport director for Air Glades Airport. He's passed away, uh, but his goal was to really develop Air Glades Airport into a cargo airport, right? And really give Miami a run for its money. Um, do I think it's a good or a bad thing? Well, look, there's a lot of freight and there's a lot of people in the state of Florida, you know, 20 million, um, you know, in population. Does anybody want to take a gander, a guess how many people come and visit the state prior to COVID every year? Aaron, 80 million. What are other, there, there's 30 million people that live in Florida, correct? Uh, 20 million, 20 million. What is it, 20 million? I don't know. My guess would be, is 10 million too low? I, I uh, try uh, try 110. Million okay, million I was gonna visits. guess if. Oh yeah, okay. it, it it throws my mind too. But you know, it, it, you see it in the last census data collection as it relates to people migrating over here from the northeast, from the west coast. Is it the weather? Is it the condos? Is it the livability? Is it the openness? I don't know. But it's all this that drives the freight component too. We as freight professionals have to look at these other components to about where people are moving, why are they moving, you know? We just picked up another house seat as it relates to another person that has to be educated, you know, another legislator that has to be educated on why freight is important. Now, it, here's where the mother hit, uh, the, the rubber hits the road as it relates to, you know, sea level rise and mitigation, right? Now, granted, whatever your, your perspective on this is, I, I try to be apolitical about this, but as it relates to, you know, from freight and logistics side, you know, you go to certain parts of Miami Beach, uh, king tide flooding is a very real thing, ladies and gentlemen. Literally right now, uh, we are raising the roads, we're raising the infrastructure in Miami Beach because of the people uh, complaining as it relates to, they can't get into uh, uh, their street. Uh, uh, FedEx and UPS cannot get me the boxes or, or my boxes that I ordered, right? So this becomes an, a very uh, personal thing to a lot of people, right? So, you know, resiliency and sustainability is something that we're also looking at too and really developing that side of the camp, right? I mentioned to you earlier about the knocks and socks, right? And the particular matter at, at these ports, right? Remember what happens, you know, you start getting a lot of containers, a lot of shipping lines, which the port might think is a great thing, right? But what kind of footprint does that have on the, the region, right? Uh, you know, uh, the the fleet is changing over. You know, you see MERS kind of changing its uh, its 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 uh, exhaust system as it relates to what it puts out. You know, hydrogen, the technologies that they're uh, we're advancing. Are we there yet? Not yet, but we're getting pretty much. Uh, we're getting there pretty fast, right? I want to leave you with this last slide because I think a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, this one is not mine. I actually stole it from the. Uh, 
the Chamber of Commerce, ladies and gentlemen, the, the, the Florida Chamber of Commerce that did a trade and logistics study back in 2013, right? So this is not transportation people talking. This is not planning people talking. This is the industry, the private sector saying that, yes, transportation is important. Logistics is important. International trade is important, right? And when you really highlight this bad boy, the state of Florida, this thing is lit, right, as it relates to population density, right, as it relates to Southwest Florida, Central Florida, you know, you see the, uh, the uh, uh, Southeast Florida kind of uh, with the population moving to this area, and it's going to become more and more, right? Again, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you guys. I'd be happy to take any questions. Here's my contact information if you need more information, uh, but uh, the dean knows me, Pierce knows me, so, you know, if you get in contact with them, they'll, uh, uh, I'll be happy to help you any way I can. Uh, with that, uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking us through this very super quick um, in primer introduction to logistics, how it is planned, the different agencies. Wonderful to know. Uh, we'll open the um, floor to questions. Will you be sharing the PowerPoint with everybody after the uh, afterwards? Absolutely. Uh, cool. Well, the, I have a question if nobody has one. Um, we have so many agencies, governmental agencies. How, how do all of them coordinate with each other? <laughs> do they coordinate at all? I mean... That, that's, the, uh, that's the challenge too. And, um, you know, is it... You know, and, and I'm talking uh, just from the, the transportation side. So maybe, you know, we engage with USDA as it relates to ag uh, trucks coming in, seasonal uh, uh, agriculture. You know, we touch the uh, Department of Agriculture, you know, uh, FAA, of course, as it relates to cargo, um, USDOT. Those are the federal agencies. But then you start going into the states, right? And there's enough to shake a stick at, right? You know, as it relates to engaging the industry, the counties, the municipalities, right? As it relates to freight and cargo and logistics, right? Because it's something that people have heard about, but they, they just don't know how to embrace it. They don't know how to work with it. Who do I talk to, you know? And, you know, the Department of Transportation, I, I have to argue, have been doing a very good job as it relates to kind of, um, let me see if I have that slide. As, as it relates to really educating people and the stakeholders, the, when I, I, I uh, in all transparency, I, I had a chance to work for the Department of Transportation. And one of the things that uh, uh, the secretary did, Anath Prasad, actually our first Indian um, secretary of transportation, uh, had the vision as it relates to really educating people on logistics and supply chain that, let me, let me, uh, let, I'll, I'll give you an analogy that he uh, that he shared with me as it relates to uh, travel times, as it relates to connectivity. And he was a turnpike guy. And he goes, you know, I know a lot of you don't like the turnpike and don't like to use a toll road because you might say, well, that's that's government charging you. Right. But then he argued, you know, how do you value time? Right. Um, you know, if I get on the turnpike, what I will I save time? You know, absolutely. And he made the analogy as it relates to, I can't justify somebody paying six bucks for a latte from Starbucks, right? Versus you paying, you know, a buck 50 or nine or a dollar to get you to your home more quickly, to get you to your job more quickly, to get you to pick up your child at daycare, because if, they, if you're over an hour late, they're going to charge you another hundred bucks, right? So as it relates to this connectivity, uh, the, the, he tried to make that inroad to people as it relates to time, right? And as, as many of us know, we live and die by time on the, on the supply chain management side, right? The connectivity. I, I did want to share, you know, I, I think I, I put it in here as it relates to what uh, Amazon was doing um, with uh, commandeering ships, right? Uh, remember, you know, it, uh, you know, Walmart has gotten into this act yet. And, you know, I love this kind of stuff because uh, uh, Walmart has, has, has said publicly, our biggest competitor now is Amazon, right? As it relates to, okay, the gloves are off. You, got, you guys are getting into our market share, right? But as it relates to, you see uh, a company like Amazon that was selling books, had a platform, you know? 
but quickly did it learn that how do we control for X, right? How do we control that our people are moaning and groaning about our products getting there late? Many of you know that they contracted with DHL, FedEx, and UPS. And, you know, when they started asking them, yes, we'd like to see your numbers. You can imagine when FedEx and UPS said, get out of town. That's what we do, you know? And you see companies really understanding the entire network, right, of things, right? And saying, you know what? Fine. We're going to commandeer our own ships. We're going to uh, get our own, own pilots, lease our own pilots. We're going to lease our own trucks for the meantime. And when we're good and ready, we're going to start building distribution facilities. And you see how this whole thing has changed upside down, right? As it relates to, you know, some of you are old enough to remember that, you know, uh, the postal service used to take about a week and a half to get anything in the mail. Uh, four to five days, three, three to four days, two to three days, next day delivery. Now you can go on Amazon and get something within the next couple of hours. Um, but people don't for forget that, well, how does that happen? Well, it happens because of a distribution facility. It happens because of you know a guy or a gal in a van delivering it to you. It happens because you know the ships are are coming at the port and getting the goods that you need um, at at a, at, a, at a reasonable time, right? Uh, and and God bless the truckers that are working miracles as it relates to getting those goods to you, right? Those truck turns, you know. Um, some of you may know that a, a good effective truck driver, he or she needs to go to a port three times three times to pick up goods, one, go again, two, and three times to make ends meet, ladies and gentlemen, to make uh, and, and make sure that the trucking company is, is making a small marginal profit, right? So this is a very co competitive business as it relates to, you know, the industry and, uh, you know, trucking companies, uh, long haul and, and short haul are, are always at, at each other's jugular, right? Mm. Thank you. I, I, you know, what, what other people think of a question, I did want to share this one, you know, it, uh, you know, the smart cities, you know, these, these metropolitan areas, right? Now, here's another challenging thing that's happening with the metropolitan areas. A lot of young people, right? We have to read, kind of read the tea leaves, right? Where are young people going? Young people are, uh, uh, young people are going to um, uh, the cities, right? The cities, it's hip, it's cool, right? It, it ain't the 1970s or 80s anymore where living in a big city was a bad thing. Now it, it's hip and cool and people want to live down in these areas. Why is this important? Well, think of it from a logistics standpoint, right? You may not know this, but FedEx and UPS actually has accounts for tickets, you know, uh, you know, encumbering tickets. You know, sometimes you see a FedEx UPS truck parked, kind of, you know, double parked. Well, that's, that's, those monies are already encumbered as it relates to look, this is the price of doing business, right? And if we mm -hmm. want to get our goods to our customers, lickety split, there are some costs that we're going to have to encumber. So just to show you how companies are looking at this as it relates to, we got to do what we got to do, right? Because this is this becomes a thing of street cred, right? But it's everything is happening in the cities now, right? So the cities have become very complicated where before you used to see 18 wheelers coming into the cities, not anymore. You see these shuttle vans, right? These smaller uh, packaged vehicles, Kind of going into the cities and doing these regional drop-offs, right? I was talking about the dean. I was talking to the dean the other day, and uh, Dean Rosh was telling me about you know maybe we should be looking at this differently as it relates to you know deliveries in the evening, right? Uh, yeah. Or maybe early in the morning. Um, California has done this, has has initiated um, these mandates by the government, mind you, right? This is not an industry led thing. This is a, a government thing. So reason why I bring in the industry with the government, because you can't have one without the other where, you know, I always run into some industry people. Well, we're going to do this. Well, you're not going to do that unless you get the, the cooperation and engagement of the locals, right? Because they'll, 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 you know, they'll drive you into the dirt and, and you'll never get up again, right? So educating the public, the, the, fed, the feds, the state, you know, the local elected officials about why, and they'll come around to it, right? And we've been very successful in the state of Florida and educating the people on that, right? Reason why I'm a big advocate of, you know, what the, what the university is doing as it relates to educating people on this forefront of logistics and supply chain, right? Because it is very much a needed area, right? Um, these sorts of courses used to be in, in, the, in the planning schools and engineering schools, right? And, but you need the business side of this, right? The return on investment, the cost benefit analysis to really make these justifications of who, what, where, and why, 
right? And then we get that, that, that participation from industry. You know, Juan, you said that uh, interesting point that especially um, airports are more of a county or local. I think there are some success stories relating a partnership between county and private companies and, mm -hmm. you know, with the airline companies, they're being very successful. I, it's, I'm surprised that we haven't seen more of it, mm -hmm. of that partnership between airports and the private mm -hmm. industry. Do you know that, anything that, about it? That, that's, a, that's a hell of a, a point. And FAA, uh, and, and if you look it up, you know, the, you'll, you'll see some ports that uh, participated in this. So the airport I mentioned to you, Air Glades, is one of those airports of this privatization that uh, the feds were working with the locals on as it relates to. Show me some airports that we can strategically develop and bring industry in. The gentleman I, I, I mentioned to you before, and I'll bring up his picture again, uh, Fred Ford was very much engaged in doing this. He, he started working with FAA, uh, working with the locals as it relates to bringing industry, right? Uh, if you've been to Henry County, uh, Henry County, there's not a lot going on over there. The airport is kind of the desolate, you know? Um, but it's, you know, something that was developed uh, back in, I think, I want to say World War One or World War Two, as it relates to um, uh, it was a it was a, a training facility for the British uh, when we were going into uh, uh, when we we're partnering up and a lot of uh, some of the um, some of the folks that uh, were helping us during the war were being trained out of uh, at at Air Glades, right? And the history of airports is very much that, right? I mean, this was on the coffers of the Department of Defense. You know, the Department of Defense and FAA, you know, was created listen, we cannot maintain all these airports and they coughed it up and gave it back to the states. Okay, states, you want them, you take care of them, right? But this becomes a maintenance and operation thing, right? Which ones are going to be prof profitable? Which ones are not going to be profitable? Uh, and oddly enough, you know, um, the, state of, uh, the state of Florida actually sees spaceports as a mode of transportation. Look it up, it's in the state statute as it relates to Cecil Field in Jacksonville, Florida, and Canaveral as it relates to the airport there uh, as a, a spaceport as it relates to connectivity, right? Mm -hmm. I think the new frontier is air cargo as it relates to, you know, uh, what these rockets are pushing up and down. You see Blue Origin, you see Sir, uh, Sir Branson, you know, with uh, Virgin Galactic. Uh, you see all this uh, buzz happening in Central Florida, but as it relates to nanotechnology, mini satellites going up in, in, in the air, and, and working uh, with our truck transportation industry, quite fascinating. Um, uh, on, a, on a side note, you know, some of you may be familiar with uh, Schneider uh, Logistics, Schneider Trucking. A lot of these, uh, 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 you know, people ask, well, what's going up in these rockets? Is it uh, science science projects from fifth graders? No, it's actually a lot of these nanotechnology satellites that are going up in space. And as it relates to these industries having their own network, right? This uh, 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 this interconnectivity of mini satellites beaming and reporting to them stuff on a platform, right? Um, CRM, customer relationship management, uh, you know, Salesforce, this kind of stuff as it relates to what's happening on the granular. Uh, Schneider Logistics has been one of the pioneers really kind of leveraging this as it relates to um, understanding where their trucks are, you know, uh, center technology, if I stop in the middle of a road, if I make a hard turn, if the truck flips over, that's being you know, communicated instantaneously, right? So the old days, right? And I and I mean this with all due respect, because there is a lady uh, present. You know, sometimes those old good old boys used to go to places that they were not supposed to go. Those truck drivers, right? And you know, this thing about well, I'm stuck in the uh, I'm stuck in traffic. Not anymore. I know where you are. Get back on the road and keep going, right? So as it relates to this transparency, as it relates to supply chain, the eye in the sky kind of stuff, uh, lean and mean, ladies and gentlemen, but that's the role with the airport and the transportation side of it too. Great question. I didn't ask him that, I didn't, I didn't tell him to ask me that either. <laughs> I, I think we can go on forever with these questions and with all the information that you have on. Yeah. Um, one last question. We're almost Please. three minutes away from the closing. Anybody? Last question. So, Juan, I'm going to ask this question uh, because that's uh, something that uh, has been uh, in the news on and off. Uh, what? And uh, a quick answer on that. What is needed on the part of Florida to become competitive with California and the East Coast ports in terms yeah. of freight and moving the freight? 
you know, great question. I was actually talking to the uh, EFI Enterprise Florida. If you're familiar with that organization, it, it's the uh, Department of Commerce. You know, they just call it something different. And the gentleman there kind of asked him the same thing too, Dean. And he goes, uh, listen, it, uh, there, you know, some of you may know that there's, there's something called the Florida Seaports Council. So all our 15 ports actually work together. And they're actually uh, coordinating a, a trade mission to California, LA Long Beach, that kind of take some of that, uh, that, um, uh, that, that business from California to, um, uh, to, to Florida. Here's, here's the rub, Dean, as it relates to, uh, to transport, you know, because remember the proximity to Asia, to uh, LA Long Beach, you know, it's a straight shot versus they come into Florida, it's got to go uh, uh, converse all the way down and then go through the Panama Canal, uh, which adds two more weeks, right? And, and guess what? Those containers right now at this time are pretty costly, right? We're talking about, you know, from, you know, 2000, uh, 2000 a pop back in the old days, now to, you know, uh, 22,000, depending what you're moving in, in, in freight, right? So the, the amount uh, uh, in, in, in controlling for cost has been a big one, right? Are there things that we can do from the state? Absolutely. There's incentives, things that the state can do, things that the, the, the government can do. And you see the ports really doing that as well too. The ports, if you've seen a port, ladies and gentlemen, you've only seen one port. What happens in an, at a port is only what happens at that port, right? The issues in Miami differ from, you know, Jacksonville, different from Miami. You know, Miami uh, and, and Port, port Everglades, one, they're like about, uh, 20 miles uh, away from each other, but so different as it relates to the cargo that they move, the suppliers that they have as it relates to east and west bound traffic versus north and south uh, bound traffic from uh, the Americas, from Europe, from Asia, right? So even that kind of component is, is very unique. Hence why you got to do the deep dive at the port and see what the focus is. Um, port of Baltimore is another one. Port of Baltimore said, listen, we can't be everything to everyone. And they decided in their strategic plan to say, we're going to be the number one auto manufacturer for as a related transporter in the country. And guess what? They are now. It took them about seven, uh, six years to, to get there. But now as it relates to Volkswagen, Ford, you know, Tesla, moving their uh, facilities as it relates to transportation, as it relates to the main port of entry that services all the auto, auto uh, uh, industry within the um, Northeast, Port of Baltimore calls that. So it's part of, you know, being, you know, uh, being very strategic and saying yes to this and no to that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We are at 1.45, which is the end of um, our scheduled time. Um, so thank you, Juan, very much for the super informative session. Lots, I'm, 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 like I said, I'm sure we can um, extend this by even one hour and you'll have so much more to say. No, it's uh, <laughs> Piyush, uh, just want to uh, let the audience know about uh, the center's next plan, not a webinar, but activity. Uh, we're offering a course on lean in March. Mm -hmm. And they can visit the center website to see more information on that. Yes. So, and um, our, our trainer is the wonderful Tom Davison. So, um, uh, yeah, we will send you more information on that so that you can stay connected and keep knowing about the events. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for being with us uh, today. And we will see, I think we will see them two months later, right now, we because of the... Um, so yes, we'll, That's correct, because uh, the second week of uh, March is spring break. Mm -hmm at FGCU, and then we have the Supply Chain Forum of Southwest Florida planned for the week after that. Week after. So we have a physical uh, we, uh, session on um, where all of us would meet. But thank you all for your time. Uh, any further questions, please free, feel free to direct them to us and we'll be happy to answer. Uh, or any suggestions about how to conduct these webinars better, new topics, let us know. We'll be happy to um, include your suggestions and try to configure them to make it more valuable to you. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank you again, everyone. Bye. Gracie, good to see you. Stay out of trouble, huh? <laughs> I, I, I try. <laughs> That's why I um, work all the time. I'll follow up with you, uh, Tracy. I'm glad you were on the call. We'll follow up.
So, I'll send you, uh, well, I'll send you the PowerPoint too. I'll, I'll send you 